I was actually going to put in there, and I, as I reflected on this, I thought, okay, I was going to have me, right? And then I was going to have God. It's actually, life is about God. <laughs> and because life is about God, and God calls us that life is about us together, to be his people. So uh, I think that in some ways is actually a better way to, to, to word that. And God's vision is for his followers to belong to a community that is rooted in him. And thus even the Psalm 133, 1 Peter, that we read this morning, it's about that we are created to be God's priests, the people who represent him in this world together. Last week we looked at God's vision to transform our broken lives. We all desire at some point in time to belong to a family and a community where we can experience reciprocal love. And that's because that's how we were created. That's our yearning. It's interesting. I don't know, does anyone read the Daily Bread here? Did you read the Bread Daily Bread today? Anyone chance? So the daily, what was it? A, a football coach, this is this is a freebie sidetrack. So uh, a football coach in Florida or somewhere um, scouted this one football player and uh, really took him on, cared for him, uh, loved him, or whatever. Mentored. Mentored. Mentored him in a significant way. Like it was a special relationship. And it just turns out this football player was adopted. And while this, uh, he was still playing for this football coach. Um, no, his, years later. Years later, okay. He found his mom. He found his mom, and his mom. He asked, "Who? Do you know who my dad is?" And he said, "Yes." And he gave the dad's name. She gave the dad's name, and that person was the football coach. <laughs> oh, wow! Surprise. <laughs> and and the the Daily Bread goes and say that it was, um, you know. Here they had this amazing relationship all these years, but now the dad got to call him my son. And he had a belonging that he had yearned for, relationship, right? Think of all the people in your life, and people maybe you as well, where you yearn for relationship, where it's broken, or what could have been, or whatever it might be. So God not only desires this for us, but he's actually provided the way to experience this through Jesus Christ. So the idea is that in Jesus Christ, our relationship with God is restored, is healed, and then we then get to see our relationships with one another. We can work on it. We can see it happen. Transformation happens bit by bit. And what I want to help, and this is a bit wordy now, so Forgive me, I'll try to go slow, but we have access to this kind of community. And when I mean that, I mean all of this together. When we center our lives on the Trinitarian community, that is the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Spirit, the Godhead. Father, Son, and Spirit. You see, when God is ruling in our hearts, and that's why this series and this teaching and scripture is so important because when God is ruling in our hearts, we experience his love for us. And with this love growing in us, we can offer it to those we meet. And that they may return that love, and or sorry, they may return the love. But of course, I think we can all say plays times in our lives where we've loved someone and they've rejected that love. They've, we've been kind to someone and they haven't cared. We've given someone to someone and they, whatever, they've taken more advantage, whatever it is. We have all experienced that where we have loved and not had it returned to us. But to love others means that you will encounter Jesus just as Jesus did on earth, many times when your acts of love will not be returned. And if we declare that we are followers of Jesus, our job is to receive love from Christ and to give that love away freely. The most practical example I have of this is if I ever give anyone any kind of, a, any kind of money to help them in a situation, 
I give it as if I'm never going to get it back again. I do it as an act of obedience to God. And then however that works itself out, it works itself out. And so then I am freely able to continue to love that person even though maybe they haven't repaid me as they said they would. In other words, our job is to receive love from Christ and to give that love away freely in its many ways that can be expressed with no strings attached to others. And this is God's vision. <laughs> and it's possible only through an interactive relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the question that we have is, is this your vision? Is this your vision is to to experience the eternal life in order to experience the life, eternal life is to do what God asks you to do, commands you to do. Is this something that you are interested in? To see your relationships with God and with each other to be something that is what we've learned before, beautiful and good and, and, and full of full of, uh, what's the word, life. Are you passionate enough about living in a healthy social community to do what Jesus is going to tell you to do as his student? Do you have the intent to pursue God's vision for your social life? Very simple question. In other words, and I, Chris is continuing to work on that song, I Surrender, I Surrender, and one day we'll get to sing it more, but that idea, I surrender, here I am, down on my knees again. Why am I down on my knees? Because someone drove me nuts today. <laughs> And if I don't like them right now, and so I'm on my knees saying, Lord, how do I love this person when they're so unlovable? <laughs> and 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 the song is, because I need you. I need you, Father. It's very simple, and yet amazing how hard it is to do. That's why we're so thankful for the Spirit of God who lives within us for this. Amen. So, if it is your intention... And as a follower of Christ, this is what we are called to, by the way, to be the people of God, to be priests, <laughs> then we will need to take some intentional steps towards bringing this into reality, to see Christ at work. As Paul says, and I continue to refer to this, now we'll refer to this, not, it won't be my last breath, I don't think, but... It will be one of my last friends because this is so foundational. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. Work out the implications of what it means to be a child of God, to be saved, what it means to be a priest. Work it out with fear and trembling. Why? Because what, a, what an amazing, holy calling we have. That we get to be God's presence in this hurting world. Because it is God who works within you. Again, works in grace. Like There's work to be done, but God's working already before we even get to that. It is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And so Willard gives four means that are going to allow us to bring the transformation in our social life. And I'm going to cover them quickly. Um, and this is more about introducing them to you. Again, these are not... These are not definitive. They're not. They're just ways. They're tools. Just like you take a screwdriver for a certain reason and a hammer for another reason. These are tools that you use. I wouldn't take a screwdriver. I'd take a power drill, right, Casey? 
<laughs> but Casey would take a screwdriver. Oh well. Um, it both work. So uh, these are important ones, though crucial ones. Um, in 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 at least this first one is foundational for sure. Receive your new ID in Christ. I think you would agree that IDs are important. Whether it be a passport, your driver's license, or any other kind of ideas, IDs, they identify who we are and they give information that is important. They allow you to do certain things. It is a formal way of saying that you belong, specifically in context of a passport. With it, it says you belong to a certain country with certain rights and certain privileges. And when we come to faith in Christ, when we trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior, to establish us in a eternal relationship with God, that is for eternity, we have received a new ID. And we know this, and yet I don't know that we ever fully understand what this means. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, for through Jesus we both have access, and there by both he means the Jew and the Gentile, so <coughs> humanity, both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, by the way, did you see that? So Jesus, Father, Spirit, the Trinity and community. And now we have that, get to enter into relationship with them. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but now we are fellow citizens with God's people. We are members of God's household. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says, listen, if every anyone is in Christ, if Christ is your ID, your Savior, you are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And really life, and sanctification, you want to use that, is about having who we are in our old way less and less and less, and who we are in Christ becoming more and more as part of our life. And that's what this whole series is about, is to help us with that. And really, that's what every Sunday service is about, and our coming together is about, and worship is about. Mm -hmm. It's about living in our new identity yeah. as God's children. And growing in it. Yeah, and remaining with him, and being with him. It literally... Jesus literally redefines my identity, who we are. And in my new identity in Christ, we find that God is our sufficiency, and he restores us to be his whole people. And this enables us to remove the poison that we have received in our relationships with people. It enables us to move forward in sincere forgiveness and blessing toward them. And it is only in this way that we can be free of the wounds of the past We need to daily receive and embrace this reality of this new identity. Each day we need to claim this promise that my life in Christ is whole and blessed. No matter what has or has not been done to me, and no matter how shamefully my relationships have been violated. And, and this is where I'm going to give assignments, because uh, I can't cover it, I don't have time. But this is where you, I encourage you to re immerse yourself in Ephesians 1 to 3, like chapters 1 to 3. Because Ephesians 1 to 3 is about all about our identity in Christ, who we are. Mm. And it begins with a prayer and it ends, almost end. well it does end with a prayer. Because that is exactly what we need to understand is that our hope is rooted in 
a prayer to God and a relationship with God about who we are and what he has done. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Another one is 1 John, which is a bit more stark. And as we read this morning, right? It's much more black and white, but it's so powerful about God's love for us as, as his children. So I encourage you to take Ephesians 1 to 3, read it in one time, read it in an easy to read translation like the message or some other that you're comfortable with, same thing with 1 John, and, and just dwell some time in it. Allow it to shape your life. The second thing we need to do is to lose the mask. Mm. A mask, what is it? It's anything that prevents us from being real. We wear masks to protect ourselves from attacks or, with, or withdrawal, as we learned last week. We also wear masks to make ourselves feel good, right? I'm pretty good, even though inside I'm messed up. Sometimes it's easier to, it's easier to live this kind of inauthentic life with other people, especially among Christians. And I don't think this is so much anymore, but you know, when I grew up, it was all about looking good, as, going, as in going to church. And then often what you did after that didn't really matter a whole lot. However, we must seek to be real and not to be defensive in our relationships. We can trust God to help us make the following statements a reality in our lives. I will be known for who I really am. I will not give my life to public approval and looking good. I will abandon all practices of self-justification, of deceit, of defensiveness, of dodging and manipulation. I will let my yes be yes and my no, no. I will not speak out of both sides of my mouth. I will be known as someone who speaks the truth and tells it in love. I was so aware of wearing a mask as a, a Christian in the life I grew, in the, I grew up with was that when I had children, I determined that I wanted to make sure that when my children saw me, that they saw me as a sinner saved by God's grace, living in God's grace. And so to me, it wasn't because so often it was like I had to look good. I had to look good. And I wanted them to know it's not about looking good. It's about being a, a child of God, a sinner and saved by God's grace. And so I would often say, please forgive me. I made sure that they know knew that I needed their forgiveness so that they understood that they too could be freely come into the presence of God and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Please forgive me. Ephesians 4, fourteen to 15, he says, um, he's instructing this um, to the, uh, about what to do, and he says this um, about the relationships and the teaching that's going on. He's talking about how do we grow up, and he says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in your in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head that is the Christ. And this idea that we will, as we lose the mask, become authentic people, relating to each other, loving each other, creating a safe space. <laughs> the next thing is, the third element is, let love, genuine love, dominate. Let it dominate our lives, our social lives. And this means that pretense is going to vanish from our life. It means, and pretense is that pretending or making plain make believe. Presenting one thing when you're actually something else. It's an attitude that tries to look right on the outside, but is insincere on <coughs> the inside. Let love dominate. And as we pursue this, 
our love will become more and more genuine. And the best overall description of the qualities that make up a community dominated by genuine love is found in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 21. I'm going to just read through it and again invite you to take this with you and read it later on. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. There's the mask. Run for dear life from evil. I want to go back to love from the center of who you are. Because, again, we're talking about, that in some ways, that there's two parts of me, right? There's the, the who I am in Christ. That was the very first thing. And then there's my, my old self. That which is still percolating up and bubbles up or is still present or shows itself. And so what Paul is saying here is love from who you are, the center of who you are. Who am I? I am Christ's child. And because so often, for instance, in the sense of forgiving someone, right? I love from the center of who I am by choosing to forgive, even though everything within me says I'm not, it's too hard to forgive. But you do it as an act of obedience. So it, it can feel like you're fake, is what I'm trying to say, when you obey God. But that's different than the other kind of fake where you're trying to portray yourself as all with it. So this is an important part, is to love from the center of who you are, allow God to define it, who you are and what you are called to do. So run from dear life from for dear life from evil. Hold on to dear life for to good. I'll go slower, yes, thank you. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. As you read this, which ones, ask yourself, which ones do you connect with at this point in time? Because it's not like you have to do, uh, this all happens at once. I think there's times in our life where it, it one rises to the top that needs to be focused on, and then maybe another, another situation in life causes another one. Be alert, servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. <laughs> Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. <laughs> Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. There's, I love that phrase. Discover beauty in everyone. Will you stick with a friendship long enough to get to the place where you can see the beauty of who they are? As far as it depends on you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go and buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness do not let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Mm. I emailed this to you, everyone, this morning, um, something, and, and then there's copies on the back table there. When you leave, you want to grab it. That's good because it got a little mixed up in the end. Did it? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. So this is printed it's, out. It's Clear, it's clear. It's, it's messed up. Yeah, I know, and I'll I can resend it as a Word doc, which is which is what it is. Okay. Um, but some people don't have Word or whatever. So, anyways, I just take this again. This is something for you to use. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to done it. I'm going to invite you though to use it as a as a tool. Um, 
if nothing, if you don't do the friend first part and take time with that, <coughs> you do the second part. Put that on. There's like something good to put on your fridge or your bathroom mirror. Uh, the, the text that says about the covenant of a community dominated by genuine love, which is really just what uh, we just read. So I invite you to do that. Um, this really works best when we experience it in Christian community with others who have made the same commitment to Christ. When our lives are lived in this manner, this is when others can taste and see that the Lord is good and be drawn to him. And the final action is simply pay it forward. Now, you may be familiar. How many have watched the movie Pay It Forward? That's an old one. but um, For followers of Christ, this thought takes on an even deeper meaning, doesn't it? When Christ, what Christ has done for us by dying on the cross, forgiving us, is impossible to pay back. What Christ invites us to do with our new lives is to pay it forward, as Paul writes in Philippians 2. If any of you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then... In other words, if, if being with Christ has meant anything, if what Christ has done for you has meant anything, then make my joy complete. In other words, what he's saying is, I'm so excited that you receive Christ, but... <laughs> To complete that, you, you need to reflect Christ. You need to live Christ. You need to allow Christ to change you. You need to follow Christ. By being like-minded. Having the same love. What kind of love that gave up? His life. Being one in spirit and purpose. What is that one in spirit and purpose that I wanted? Jesus, what did Jesus do? He said, I, I only see what the Father is doing. I want to do what my Father asked me to do. And I can trust him because he is totally and absolutely good. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. In fact, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, to be held on to, to demand it as his right, but rather he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human being. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. We're going to go into communion now. I want us to take this little section here to... I'm gonna, we're going to sing... Um, uh, when I survey, but and then we're going to drink communion. I'm going to leave this, put this back up, and I'm going to invite us to to um, to use this as a focus, to have some reflection time. Of this is what Christ has done, and He invites us to have the same attitude. But in order for us to have that same attitude, we need to be grounded and rooted in Jesus Christ. So let's sing it together. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died.
Yeah.